Our first scripture reading is taken from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 1 through 6. Since uh, our text is taken from Matthew 16 and speaks about stones, uh, also uh, we uh, see here in uh, the prophecy of Isaiah also speaking of stones. So Isaiah 51 verses 1 through 6. God's word reads here as follows. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of a song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples, the coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Let us now turn to uh, the New Testament and uh, read from uh, Matthew 16. Matthew 16, and we read the verses 13 through 23. And um, this uh, passage that comes after that the Lord has warned the disciples for the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaven, and that uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees just followed their own mind and their own, their own teachings. And so then the Lord continues uh, with uh, verse 13 as follows. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And ever what you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Thus far our scripture reading up to verse 20, so not verse 23. But 
And the text is then especially, uh, we give special attention to verse 18. It's a very well known and the intriguing part of the text where the Lord says, and I read it a little bit different than in your translation, and I tell you, you are, and in our text is Peter, but really there the Lord says, and I tell you, you are a rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you start building something, for example, a house or a garage or a workshop, a lot of preparations must be taken place. A plan needs to be drawn up, a place to be chosen, materials for the building have to be gathered, and those materials, materials have to be worked on and all their that they fit in their specific place. The costs also must be calculated. And after all those preparations, the groundbreaking ceremony can take place. Well, in Matthew 16, the Lord Jesus speaks about his building work. He will build his church. He has a plan. He has his materials. He also knows the cost. Building his church would cost our Lord Jesus everything. And the amazing truth is that he involves his people. First, his disciples as foundation stones. Then others also would be collected, would be gathered, including us, including you here in Regina, included in his collection work as well, collecting materials. And so this morning we will see our Lord Jesus busy as the master builder of his church. And for that building work, he gathers a first foundation stone, then he collects other foundation stones, and in the last place, he collects believers, us, as his living stones. So Christ builds his church. In doing that, he first he collects Simon as a stone. Simon as the Texas son of Bar-Jonah, from Jonah. Then he collects the other foundation stones, and that are the other disciples. And finally, he collects living stones, the New Testament believers. But to start off further, uh, we have to be a little bit technical. That's always necessary when tracking a building process. You need to be somehow technical. So bear with me. And I have heard also from uh, your own pastor that uh, you can make it a bit difficult. It doesn't matter. People will understand. So we will be a bit technical. And maybe you, le you will learn a few words in the Greek language. This, how exciting is that? So, I'd like to mention the key words of our text in regard to the building materials. And they are very clearly described by the Lord. His materials are a single rock or a single stone. 
And the second is then he locates a solid rock formation. And then in the first place, he gathers his believers, and they, they square with the points as I just mentioned. And now it comes, the single stone in Greek is Petros. Petros. Yeah? And then that solid rock formation, or the slab, the total slab where the church is built up. The Greek word for that is Petra. So one, uh, a few letters different. The first one was Petros, the stone, and the formation, the slab, is Petra. And then he gathers the believers, and the Greek word for that is Ecclesia. Ecclesia. Ecclesiastical, you know, that word uh, comes from the, well, the English word, but uh, the Greek word is Ecclesia. So keep that in mind. Petros, Petra, Ecclesia. Well, let us now see how the Lord Jesus gets his materials. On a certain day, the Lord Jesus walked with his twelve apostles in uh, the neighborhood of the city of Caesarea Philippi, where he, and the area was scattered with rocks and stones. It could well be that they were at a construction site there. They passed it. Perhaps some builders were busy in laying a foundation. And our Lord Jesus then used that area for a groundbreaking site for his own building work. But he stopped. He stopped and he, uh, and he asked, what do men now say that the Son of Man is? And you see and you hear then uh, the different answers of the disciples. Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and again others they say the prophet Jeremiah of, or, or, or one of the other prophets. But then his important next question is, but you, what do you say who I am? Simon, who speaks on behalf of the others, said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Let's now note, Simon does not say John's thinking is this, James' opinion is is as follows. Andrew has again another view, but my own conviction differs from that. You don't hear that. The one conviction of Jesus' disciples stood over against the conflicting opinions of the Jews. The Jews let themselves be guided by their own mind. You read that in the foregoing paragraph of our text passage. And the Lord Jesus calls that the leaven of the Pharisees. They follow their own mind and their own teachings. But Simon's answer showed that they were directed by something else. By what? By what is his answer directed? We read by the wisdom from above. As the Lord Jesus himself indicates, for he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Your own mind didn't come up with it, but my Father, it comes from my Father who is in heaven. Well, that reaction of the Lord totally torpedoes most people's ideas about faith and church. Coming to faith, beginning a new church, often the first focus is on man. Think of expressions such as Peter and Paul are the founders of the Christian religion. Or this saying, he or she has accepted Christ. Or that church planter started a new church. You see, the emphasis then on man. Beloved, is church history first and foremost an account of the actions of men, of people? Matthew 16 gives a clear answer to such questions. No, 
No, Scripture says here, Christ is the church planter. He is the church builder. Of course, people are involved in faith and church building. Yet who truly is behind all that? Does Christ commend Peter for his confession? No, the Lord does not commend the, work, the words of a man. What he does is he rejoices in his Father of bringing salvation to all peoples and nations. And for that reason, God brought his Son into the world. And therefore, look, beloved, in Matthew 16, Simon, because that's the Lord how it directs it time and again to his first apostle, his disciple, Simon, you are the mouthpiece of my father. Now listen carefully. Our text usually is understood as if the Lord changed the name of Simon into Peter. Simon got a name change. Is that true? Though, yes, he later on carried that name, yet here a name change doesn't fit the circumstances our text describes. Here, the emphasis, as said already, the emphasis is not on man. We don't read something like, from now onwards, I give you the name Peter. From now you will be called Peter. So, what actually then really was going on there in Caesarea Philippi? Well, the Lord Jesus just heard that the Father had worked the witness in man, in Simon, that he, Jesus, is Christ. Well, that is foundational for the truth of God's salvation work. Before the time of Christ, salvation from sin was for a long time limited to one nation. Through Christ, God's salvation will be extended to all nations. And that truth will happen through the powerful witness that the apostle disciples said, Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Christ's church will be the broadcaster of that truth. And as God's Old Testament nation has its foundation in Israel's 12 tribes, so would the New Testament church have its foundation in the 12 apostles. That's in Revelation 21. Through them, the loving God will make a star that all nations will share in God's salvation work. Through His Son, by God's Word and Spirit, out of the whole human race, God will gather, protect, and preserve for Himself a communion chosen to everlasting life. Your confession in Lord's Day, 50, uh, Lord's Day 21, question answer 54. And so indeed, beloved, our gospel text shows that in Caesarea Philippi, Philippi, God's Son starts to lay the foundation of his church. There, he, as it were, picks up his disciples as building material. He first takes Simon as a usable stone. The phrase translated as, I tell you, you are Peter, as already indicated, actually reads, I tell you, you are a rock. You are a Patros. Look, beloved, that short phrase, I tell you, you are a rock, vibrates with divine joy. And by that, Jesus expresses, oh, Simon, you are the first foundation stone. You are the first one. The foundation stone for my church. A congregation, only Christ as God's Son has the power and gets the resources to build His church. And thus, as 
God's master builder. We see him at work here in Matthew 16. Simon, he says, and indicates him that his idea is then, is also, his identity is son of Jonah. Simon is taken there as the first stone for the foundation of Christ's church. And as the master builder, we see them at work there in Matthew 16. Yes, Simon, the son of Jonah, is taken as the first stone for the foundation of Christ's New Testament church. And that Simon is the first, that he is the first rock stone implies that the Lord picks up more foundation stones. The first one will be followed by others. And so we come to our second point. For indeed, beloved, the qualification of being a stone must be extended to the other disciples. They are indicated by a slight word change, as we already have seen. For Simon, the word Petros, a single stone, is used. For the others, the word Petra, that is a, la a large, solid rock foundation, is taken. Together, they form then the large slab or the large rock formation on which the foundation of the church is built. The church is built. That's what Christ points at with the words, on this rock formation I will build. And that pronoun this does not refer to the person of Simon only. The word this points to the other disciples as well. They too were present, as we read. They have also answered the Lord on that question. So they have already involved themselves in the discussion too. As Simon, they had followed Christ and witnessed his work. And therefore, as the apostolic foundation of the church, they would receive the commission to bring their witness to all the nations in the world. That's the well-known text, Matthew 28, 19 to through 20, that Christ gave at his ascension. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of this age. In our text then, Christ speaks about people as stones. And let us look where scripture does the same, taking people as stones, as we read in Isaiah, Isaiah 51. We read there, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit of quarry from which you were taken, from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, to Sarah, who bore you. When I called him, he was but one, and blessed him, made him many. In that prophecy, beloved, God took his Old Testament from the quarry of Abraham. In other words, the Old Testament Israel was built on Father Abraham. The Old Testament Church of Israel was built on Abraham. Now, the image of stones for God's children is also used by John the Baptist. In Matthew 3, verse 8 through 9, John the Baptist says to the Jews, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as father. For I say to you, God is able to raise up children to Abram from these stones. Matthew 3, 8 through 9. There, Scripture makes clear that without the means of flesh and blood, so put positively then, as we know, through the means of grace, that is through the gospel witness, through Jesus' truth, God has the power 
to make children and from these stones and not from the rock Abraham. And so reading our text against the background of the Bible's usage of rock and stones, we ask, on what does the Lord Jesus build his New Testament church? Does he build on the rock of Abraham, on man's flesh and blood? No, here in the New Testament, the Lord says, on this rock, on this Petra, that is indeed Simon, but it is not the Simon of flesh and blood. The person Simon is only weak. Simon in himself is not usable. In the next passage, if you read on, the Lord even had to discard Simon, the Simon of flesh and blood. Beloved, let's observe well. Again, it needs to be emphasized. The New Testament church is not built on man. It doesn't have its origin in man of flesh and blood. Like the confession of Simon, the church comes from above, from heaven, from God the Father, in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why over against the opinions of the Jews about the identity of Christ, through Simon Peter, the disciples testified, all the disciples testified about the only truth from heaven, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. In Matthew 16, Simon Peter then is mentioned as the first among equals. The other disciples shared the blessing of being the foundation stones with him. With him, with Simon, son of Jonah, they were participants in establishing Christ's apostolic church through their witness that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the witness that sounds till today. The disciples together formed the Petra, the rock slab foundation on which Christ built his church. Beloved, we need to understand what an important moment our text reveals. The rock, the solid rock foundation of Christ's church is rock solid. Especially remember that also from the preaching of this morning. The solid rock foundation of Christ's church is rock solid. It is laid by the master builder of our Lord. He took his 12 disciples, marking them to be the foundation of the church. Well, you see, very well, it's very well known that by, by laying a foundation, and you know that from day to day life as well around you, just laying a foundation, the building work isn't finished. It needs an upper structure. Ongoing building work for Christ church is needed. More stones, therefore, more stones need to be gathered, have to be put in place. Well, the Lord will gather them too for his building work. And doing so, he doesn't leave you out of the picture. No one here. He doesn't leave you out of work either. And so we have come to our last point. In our text, we are not only informed about the materials for the foundation of the church, the Lord also reveals the materials to be used for building upon that foundation, the upper structure indeed. In our text, we read the same characterization for the church as we find in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, there the Lord says and talks about the ecclesia, the church of the living God, that it is the pillar and ground of the truth. And the truth then is, as Peter and the disciples confess, that Jesus is the Son 
of the living God. That is the truth. Your Savior. Holy Scripture then makes clear that the church is not a building of wood and stone. In our text, the Lord doesn't say, I will build my temple. No, he says, I will build my ecclesia. And that word means assembly, a group of living people together. It points to a body of members, indeed living people. The foundation consists of living people, the disciples, and the upper structure also consists of living people. The, the building material is living people. That's why in his first letter, Peter speaks about believers as living stones. A well-known passage of 1 Peter 2. Maybe a suggestion to read it today is at home as well. 1 Peter 2, where Peter speaks about believers as living stones. So the concrete church of the Lord is not made from concrete, but is the gathering, the assembly of God's people. And so I repeat, the church has a living, living structure. In Matthew 16, the Lord then uh, dug up and gathered the materials for the foundation, as we have seen, and then through his apostles, through the gospel preaching, the Lord would dig up and gather all the materials for building upon that foundation. He would do so not only from God's Old Testament people, but, as you know now, from all the nations. And it happens as the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. This, this is like at, uh, in, in time uh, of Isaiah, that people from the coastlands, also in Isaiah 51 we have read, people from coastlands, and that's including us, will be gathered as God's people. So imagine this congregation. At the time the Lord spoke the words of Matthew 16, the words of our text, then at that time the Lord was only surrounded by few people. However, as Jesus looked at this very humble beginning, what did the Lord Jesus see? Well, then, amazing, then he saw his complete church by saying and talking about that word ecclesia. It means that he saw the complete church then and there already. So then and there, the Lord Jesus also saw you as the church in Regina. Isn't that wonderful? There in Caesarea Philippi, the Lord saw all those whom he would choose, who would believe in him through the preaching of the apostles. Then he saw you. Then he saw us gathered even today. And so, beloved, an important matter now is to know where Christ gathers his church. Is it there where people organize things after their own plans, dogmas, opinions, feelings? Is it there where people follow their own tradition or culture? Let's beware of our Lord. Let's beware, congregation since that groundbreaking ceremony of our text, Satan's competition has been strong and fierce as well. Satan is also has, was busy in building his churches, buildings by flesh and blood of men. That means after man's designs, his likes and feelings. You know, the Jews, the Jews don't want to give up their place they hold on to Jerusalem. Rome doesn't want to get rid of his Pope and its Vatican, the temple. Mecca 
is the place where Muslims follow their Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Furthermore, many churches, faith, and sects follow their own leaders, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. But that is the counter-building of God's opponent, Satan. His counter-building work has caused a lot of misery, blood, death, divisions, much sadness till today. Indeed, beware, be warned, the Lord says in our text, over against Christ's bulwark of truth and life. Satan builds his fortress of falsehood and death. And that attack was immediately launched after Christ had spoken the words of our text. Then immediately the devil tried, if you read on, you see here that the devil tried to pick up Simon Peter to make him into his evil instrument. Satan continued his attacks, making use of the disciple Judas, of his unbelief, of Thomas' doubt, of Saul's, later on the Apostle Paul, of his misguided zeal, of despotic rulers in the time of the early church and in the Middle Ages. Until today, in our postmodern society, Satan stirs up the thoughts, moods, feelings, and desires of flesh and blood of man. Congregation, Satan has been always a star to work with those human senses, with, so to speak, the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, man's thoughts and desires and thinking. Yet, despite all Satan's poisonous aggressions from the gates of hell, the master builder of the church continues his work. As the son of the living God, he prevented Satan from capturing Peter in his web. The betrayal of Judas contributed even to the victory over death. Christ took Thomas' doubt away. The Lord Jesus arrested the Jew, the, the Jew Saul, and powerfully changed him in the Apostle Paul. And now, every Lord's Day, he calls you twice to his ecclesia, his church. And here then, he continues to chipping away on you for your service as living stones in his church building work. And so congregation that you are here worshiping the Lord as his faithful Christian church confirms the truth of Matthew 16. The worship services here are the heavenly witness of Christ's being at work. He is picking you up as living stones all of you, young and old, in his ongoing building work. He gives you a place on the foundation of Christ and his apostles. And what a miracle that is. For who are we? Who are we? Are we nicely clean and polished stones? Oh no. The Lord also needs to dig us out. He has to mine us from the earthly and dusty quarry of sin and filth. A lot of roughness needs to be chiseled away from us. Uneven spots need to be planed and smoothened away. That happens through his word and through church discipline. God the Spirit is doing that work especially when we together are together on Sundays under the power of God's word. In a holy liturgy, praising God, acknowledging that Christ is the Son of God, the Son of the living God, that Christ is the King 
of kings and the Lord of lords. So rejoice, congregation, that Christ's building work takes place also by you as a living stone. In a dark and collapsing world, you are picked up to be inserted into the spiritual house. Here, the master builder of the church prepares your access to his heavenly rooms for everlasting life and peace and glory. For Christ our Savior conquered sin and Satan. He triumphs over grave, over the grave. And he, in the Revelation we read that, and he, Jesus, shall reign forever and forevermore. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Amen.